From the Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University in Houston, Texas, this is Baker Briefing. I'm Ambassador David Satterfield. Baker Briefing tackles the most critical foreign and domestic policy issues of the day. Each episode is recorded in front of a live audience at Rice University. Today's topic, the Russia-Ukraine war. And today I'm pleased to welcome John Teft, former ambassador both to Ukraine and to Russia. Ambassador Teft, thank you for joining us in Baker Hall this afternoon. I'm delighted to have as our guest for this Baker briefing, Ambassador John Teft. John is an old friend, a colleague. He had an extraordinary and extraordinarily long foreign service career that brought him from the early 1970s through to just a few years ago into contact with the personalities and the issues which very much have shaped the challenges as well as the successes that the United States has had that the United States confronts in the world today. In particular, John's experience in Eastern Europe post-fall and pre-fall of the wall as ambassador to Lithuania, to the Ukraine, and to Russia. And Georgia. And Georgia, which we should not forget. The Caucasus are part of the area of challenge today. Uh, give him an extraordinary perspective on the questions which I think many of us have, some of which I will try to phrase on your behalf for John today. But I look forward very much to this discussion. John, we're delighted to have you here. And I will start off with the big question on everyone's mind, the war in Ukraine. How does it end? When does it end? What does Putin want? I think, David, the answer to your question is what you ended it. What does Putin want? Because the first two parts of your question, I think only he knows. Now, obviously, the Ukrainians, if they're successful militarily, can have a big impact on that. But I suspect Putin himself does not know exactly how this is going to end now. I think it's no secret. We all look at the TV and read the newspapers that this has turned into a really horrible strategic miscalculation on the part of Putin. He thought this was going to be easy. He totally miscalculated the Ukrainians, and he's done that from the beginning. And I can go back into that if you'd like. I go back in Ukraine to, to 1991, actually, and at many stages all the way through. But he miscalculated NATO, he miscalculated the United States, and I think he may be miscalculating his own situation at home, although it's hard to tell that for sure now because it's a very oppressive type of situation. There's a lot of people who have ideas about how this can end from Ukrainian victory to some kind of a territorial compromise. The Ukrainians are very angry for obvious reasons with all the people who've been killed with the horrible destruction of their country. And as a friend of mine who was recently meeting with a group of uh, Ukrainians in Davos at the January economic conference, these people are not, apart from Zelensky and the government, the local people, the average Ukrainian is in no mood for any kind of a political compromise. I think we just don't quite know at this point. We'll see this spring, we're watching the Russians with this offensive that they're trying to take Bakhmut, a city which I think has no tremendous strategic value, but it's become a symbol for the Russians. If they can do this, they can say, by God, we're winning. We've won something back. And I think that's for domestic consumption as much as anything else inside of Russia. But at some point this spring, by almost everybody's account, the Ukrainians are gonna go on the offensive and they're gonna use a lot of the weapons that have been given to them by the United States and West Europeans. And they're gonna start, I don't know, I'm not privy to obviously their plans and I shouldn't be, none of us should be, but I think they'll probably try to go straight down to cut the northern shore of the Black Sea, which the Russians have occupied. Remember, if you can visualize in your minds the map, you've got eastern Ukraine, Donetsk over here, Mariupol, and then over to Crimea. They will try to cut that. The other thing is, as a military officer who's a good friend of mine said to me not long ago, if they get down to the shore, they can fire HIMARS and other things at the bridge through which the Russians bring over their troops and the supplies. I think we'll have a better sense come the summer of where this is, whether we're in a long war of attrition, which I think is what Putin actually hopes for. I noticed today, I was watching the TV, Avril Haines, the director for national intelligence, says that our intelligence community estimate is that they're not going to be able to take back significant parts of land, the Russians. 
I don't think she said, or at least I didn't see what she, what her prediction was going to be on the Ukrainians, but I think they believe they can actually do some of this. Last point I'll make to a long answer, David, is that there's a lot of people out there speculating now, writing articles about what could this look like, especially if uh, the Russians are not completely pushed out. If you ended up with a situation where you end up with a frozen conflict, you know, the famous term that we've used for other places in Georgia and elsewhere, what does it look like? Do you end up with a demilitarized zone? The one thing that seems to be pretty clear is that Ukraine they may not become a member of NATO, but given all of the weapons that have gone in there and given the support that the United States and Europe have given Ukraine, that situation has transformed. The Ukrainians are now much more deeply rooted in the West than they ever were. And Henry Kissinger in a piece last December said, the situation now has changed so dramatically. The idea of neutrality, which you'll remember was mentioned at the beginning of the war, he said, that's off the table now. These people are now part of the West. But there's still a lot of people trying to think through what that is. John, let's assume that, in fact, the Russians cannot significantly improve their military situation. Ukraine cannot expel Russia or force them back to the February lines of 21, where the conflict <coughs> began. It is of sorts a frozen conflict. And Putin continues with his Eastern Europe, 1945, destroy, bomb, destroy, bomb the grid to make Ukraine as unlivable as possible and the government as incapable as possible, looking at the coming winter of 23, 24, to sustain the fight. What should the coalition, what should the United States and our partners be doing now if that's in fact the shaping frame for how this moves forward. Yeah, I'm not sure that it's necessarily going to be the shaping frame, David. I, I just am not totally sure of that. It could be. It could be one of a variety of different results. I think the key part here is, on our side, is the support that the United States and Europe have given. And we all know, we read the newspapers every day, there are elements in our political life, people who are uncomfortable. I think it's still a minority giving money to Ukraine. Part of this, at least as I understand it, is good old-fashioned American isolationism, but it's also uh, driven by some of our own domestic politics. And I work for the RAND Corporation. It's a very bipartisan group, so I, I'm not going to get into domestic politics with you at all. I leave that to to David or somebody else in the group. But I think that the, uh, you know, if we end up with a situation where you have a standoff, where neither side has achieved its objectives, where do you go from there? And I mentioned to David last night, there's an interview in The New Yorker uh, about two weeks ago with a historian named Stephen Kotkin. I don't know if this name means anything to you. He's left Princeton and is now out at Stanford in the Hoover Institute. But Steve has published two and is about to publish, I think, the third volume of a biography of Joseph Stalin. This is, this is one of the great scholars of our times. And, he, in his latest interview in The New Yorker with David Remnick, speculates on a South Korea type of situation. And he also recalls the divided Germany. For him, the key thing, he said, this is not the optimum. He hopes that the Ukrainians win and drive the Russians out. But it's not the worst thing that could happen. In his view, what really should be done in that case is to make sure that Ukraine is clearly a part of Europe. Now, this may not necessarily mean part of the European Union right away, but certainly whatever Ukraine has, that should be clearly a part of Europe, European and American support going ahead. He uses the South Korea example. I'm not sure that that's actually the best one. And I know some of my friends who don't want to even talk about this because they don't want to even countenance the idea the Ukrainians would actually do this at this point. But there's a lot of people who are talking about it, as you indicated, David, not just in our own government, I think, and in Europe, but I think we're talking also to the Ukrainians about this. And in fact, Toria Newland, our Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, acknowledged almost that in an interview she gave that I watched not long ago. Given Putin's apparent mindset at present, which is not conducive to entering into meaningful, serious negotiations. What should Zelensky be doing? I hope that he's trying to think all of this stuff through, you know, the same questions that you've just asked here. But he's turned out to be, as one of my friends said, a far better wartime president than he ever was a peacetime president. 
I mean, this is uh, Churchillian and other adjectives are used to describe this guy. There's no question that he has done an amazing job, not just rallying the people of Ukraine. You know, the guy's on TV every single night speaking to the people of the country. He's done a terrific job of rallying support. You know, we see him on TV. He, I think he's on again tonight with Wolf Blitzer on CNN. He's doing interviews all the time. He's a master communicator. He learned this when he was acting, you know, this series where he was the school teacher who becomes president of Ukraine. It's almost like the movies become the reality almost. But the guy really knows how to communicate. Uh, my wife, Mariella, is here with me. And we saw him in action right after he was elected in 2019, which was the last time I was able to go to Kiev because of COVID and the rest of it. But the guy's an extraordinary talent. There's no other way to do it. I assume what they're doing now is planning whatever the spring offensive is. That's number one. But number two, I think they have to be thinking through how they're going to proceed. If they have some success in driving down to the shore and seizing back some of the land in the south, I suspect the East is going to continue to be a, some kind of a standoff because the Russians have built in line after line of trenches there. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, this new production that's out there. I watched it a couple of weeks ago and then I turned on the news and it was uncanny because right after the movie with this horrible trench warfare and these young men going up over the walls and getting mowed down, on comes a video from a Ukrainian drone, uh, one of these Wagner Group attacks in Bakhmut that we've, I think you've seen on TV. And it was like, same thing, you know, it's over a hundred years ago and yet nothing's changed. It's horrible, just terrible. The war. These poor innocent guys dying in this war. I think the other thing that's going on is, I know this in Washington, I work for RAND, the RAND Corporation part-time, and a lot of the think tanks there are doing work to looking at the reconstruction of Ukraine. Now, we still don't know a lot of the big answers to the big questions, but there's a lot of work going on there, and Zelensky and his own team, I was on a panel at Georgetown University last week with the ambassador of Ukraine, and she was, you know, she's clearly into this and working with a lot of American experts on the Hill, in the government, in the administration, but also with some of the think tanks, because there's some really smart people who've done nothing on this scale, obviously, but they've done things like rebuilding after the Puerto Rican hurricane. Several of my colleagues at RAND did the conceptual plan for how to do the reconstruction of the island. Still hasn't been completely done. But there's those kinds of things, and I know the Ukrainians are doing that as well. He's probably got a lot of other things on his mind as well, David, but those are, I think, probably the top three. John, one of the policy debates going on in not just Washington, but other major capitals, certainly in Berlin and in Brussels with respect to NATO, is countering Putin's strategy of attrition of just outlasting us and the Ukrainians in a brutal, slow, grinding fashion. Uh, until we tire of it, pivot away, he's convinced we, which is the world, not just the West or the US, we're intrinsically weak, Russians are strong, we're strategically impatient, all of us, Russia is strategically patient, and he can outlast us. And the sanctions don't have a decisive impact, at least in the near term, that will compel him to change his policy. So the debate is, do you accelerate dramatically the quality and the quantity of weapons delivered to allow Ukraine to be able to strike in Russia at Russian targets with a much more vigorous fashion to try to compel or reshape Putin's thinking. If you do that, do you run the risk of cornering Putin? Does it work too well? Putin confronts a situation which he can't manage and thus is driven to an escalation. And the escalation, which of course concerns Washington policymakers, and I think the president directly, is one that involves either the demonstration of or actual battlefield use of some form of nuclear device. What is your appraisal of wisdom, ill wisdom in, in this debate? Where should it come out? I think you've actually just summarized how Joe Biden thinks about this in the sense that what he has done is a very slow progression, increasing the quality and the scope of the weapons that we provide and that our European allies are providing to the Ukrainians. And I think he's done this, uh, he doesn't say it quite this way, but 
my impression is that he has done this in a way that we keep raising the ante slowly, but not to the point where it's some kind of make or break issue with Putin. Now, I tune into a bunch of the military experts. You see some of them on the TV, General Mark Hurtling, who's often on CNN. There's others out there. Many of them now would like to have us give the Ukrainians the next missile system, a thing called ATACMS, A-T-A-C-M-S. And what this is can be fired from the same launcher as the HIMARS, which they use so effectively, the ones that we gave them. But these can go further. They could, depending on where they fired them, I suppose, get into Russia. But the idea would be if you give this to them, you get the assurance that we've had on, on some of the others that you're not going to fire these into Russia and produce what Joe Biden has said and what Tony Blinken has said, described as Biden's policy. We're not going to go have World War III over this conflict that Putin has started. And so I think you've tried to see that. The second thing is, I don't know if there's a separate plan here, David, or not, but no sooner did Joe Biden said, we don't need to give them F-16 airplanes right now, then reports are out that there's a group of Ukrainian pilots training on F-16 simulators somewhere else. So there may be something more here that I don't know. I'm not in government anymore. This is one of the hardest things for people like David and I now. When we're no longer there, you can talk to people, but do the best you can with your experience, which you don't know for sure, put it that way. Anyway, I think that on the nuclear question, there was an interesting piece in the Financial Times on the anniversary of the war about a week or so ago. There's a fellow named Max Seddon who is their correspondent. He's very good. And he quoted two Russian sources that said that Putin has actually looked at the idea of using a battlefield nuclear weapon and come to the conclusion that it serves no useful purpose for the Russians. Now, this is something that six months ago I read American generals say, because, you know, you, battlefield nuclear weapons can cause enormous damage, but they're not necessarily something you can use as a means to get to another end that you're not going to get otherwise. Plus, if you were to use them in eastern Ukraine, the prevailing westerly winds would blow the contamination, guess where? Into Russia, among other things. So I think a desperate Putin, perhaps, if things really started to collapse. But I think in the short term, there's this slow, methodical effort to try to increase. Not as fast as the Ukrainians obviously would like, but there's a lot of people in Washington now who are saying, given how hard this is going to be, better to, to go in bigger now especially to help the Ukrainians get back the land rather than let this become just the hard multi-year war of attrition, the hard slog. John, the final question, it's a serious one, and it really is important to have your views to have it understood. I think it's fair to say, and, and I've heard in Washington over these last months, uh, both parties in Congress, both houses express the view that Americans need to understand why why the checks keep getting written, why the arms keep flowing out to Ukraine. It doesn't seem to have a timeline for an end. People want to know why their highway, their bridge is not being repaired, their infrastructure project not addressed. We can all of us cite, and my favorite anecdotal number is Americans in 2022 spent a third more on video game content than the total amount of economic assistance provided since the start of this conflict to Ukraine. Now those numbers are interesting, but they mean nothing at a constituent level. So my question to you is, why does the outcome of this conflict matter to Americans and to America? Before Christmas, George Will, the conservative columnist, wrote a number of pieces in the Washington Post where he argued for us to provide tanks. You remember the debate uh, before the final decision was made in coordination with the Germans. And he described it, and I like this phrase, he calls this a century-shaping conflict. In other words, the result of this war is going to have impacts beyond what any of us can see, even the smartest analysts can see right now. I mentioned before Henry Kissinger and how his views have changed on Ukraine. I think some of the best and the brightest minds out there who've seen this understand that there's so much more, I think you said it, David, at stake here than just, I shouldn't say just, it's important, sovereignty, territorial integrity, independence, these principles that we've all articulated, which America has stood for. But beyond that, what's going to happen in certainly European security, 
what will happen in Russia? And remember, as one of my bosses always used to say to me, there's only one country in the world that can destroy the United States of America, and that's still Russia. Now, the Chinese are building up their ICBM force, but it's going to be many years before they can actually do the damage that the Russians can do. And the Russians are modernizing, and we can talk about that if you'd like. But I think there's going to be impacts here that we just can't know. I'm not a China specialist, but I've had many friends say to me that how this war comes out in Ukraine will have a profound impact on the way Xi Jinping sees his own future, specifically related to Taiwan. And that if the West, the United States, stands up and supports Ukraine down the line, this is, I think, a critical factor. I sometimes have this question asked to me by my family, my wife's family in particular, who live out in Chicago and uh, places. And I try to liken it to, not, not the same, but some of the principles are similar to World War II. You know, my dad, my wife's father, I'm sure many of your relatives fought in Europe or in Asia, and the greatest generation. These are the people who died, who fought, yes, for the intangibles of freedom, but also for practical things. Keeping Europe whole and free and at peace is a dollar and cents issue for us too. I, mean, I don't think I need to tell this audience how linked the American economy is to the European economy, how linked our economy is to the independent nations of Asia. Now, we haven't talked too much about China, but I think there's a bigger issue there too. But all my China expert friends all tell me that this war isn't just about security. It will work in the mind of Xi Jinping and many of the Chinese leaders. And all of my policy friends tell me no one in the world is watching this more carefully, posturing themselves publicly more adroitly than she. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal both geopolitically, it's a big deal for our own future, our economic future, our dollars and cents future. It's not just some kind of a, what are they doing over there in the center of Europe? Just remember, the center of Europe is where World War I and World War II started. John, thank you very much. Baker Briefing is brought to you by the team at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. This episode was produced by Victoria Jupp and Shannon Moriarty. AV production was led by Kevin Young. The Baker Institute for Public Policy provides meaningful policy analysis on the most critical challenges facing Texas, the United States, and the world. It is a nonprofit, nonpartisan policy research organization based at Rice University. To learn more, including how you can attend a live podcast recording on the campus of Rice University, visit us at bakerinstitute.org.